Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Islamic Center at New York University podcast coming to you straight from the heart of New York City. We're building an amazing Muslim community here at ICNYU where everyone is welcomed and respected no matter where you're from or where you're at. This is the place to be. So open your ears and your heart and come along with us on another life-changing journey. Bismillah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا مولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله. In the name of Allah the gracious, the merciful, all praise is due to Allah the Lord of the universe, the master of the day of judgment. I bear witness and testimony to the oneness of Allah, to his magnificence, his omnipotence, his might, his glory, to his being the creator and sustainer of all things, the giver of life, the guider of hearts, the master of the day of judgment. And I bear witness to the fact that Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the servant and final messenger. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and upon all those who choose to tread in his path until the last day. Amongst the du'as that we are taught that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would make, there is one that quite often many of us engage in the prism of protection from anxiety. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-huzn. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that, Oh Allah, I seek your refuge, your protection from anxiety and sorrow. And as he continues on, there are other things that he makes du'a for protection from within this particular supplication. من العجز والكسل from inability and laziness من الجبن والبخل from cowardice and miserliness and then the next thing that he makes du'a seeking protection from is burdensome debt and the last the repression of men when we think about this du'a and we hear it within many circles, we don't necessarily go past the first couple of things. But these last two, the dar al dain and the ghalabat al-rijal, the burdensome debt and the repression of men and how these two things coincide but are deeply impactful, especially the notion of being in a place where one is just drowning and drowning in financial anxieties. May Allah protect us from it. And to think about this now within two prisms, the dua that I individually can make, but also how can I be the answer to somebody else's dua? To be bold enough to live in a way where there's not egocentricity within this deen in any capacity, but a God-centric reality that allows for me to recognize the role that I play in being a source of empowerment, a source of support, a source of solidarity for people of any background, rooted in what our tradition teaches us. When you have foundational hadith that say things to you that you will not enter paradise until you believe and it then gives to us context into how it is that we can deepen in the completion of that imam, that faith and you will not have that faith until you love one another. Or in other narrations that say things to the effect of لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه that not one from amongst you will believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. 
Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah, when he gives commentary on this hadith, he says that the brother that's being referred to is not your brother in faith, but your brother in humanity. And thinking about this now within the prism of this dua, that gives to us an insight and understanding collectively and communally, as well as individually, how do we love for others what we love for ourselves to the extent that we are bold enough to be creative, to think about not why others might fail, but where we have success in this world and in the next by not being those who are repressive of our brothers and sisters, but a means through which we alleviate their burdens. A society that is rooted in anti-blackness, built upon principles of supremacy, that give the understanding of a primordial state of existence to be rooted in whiteness, builds out structures and systems that are purposely built to ensure that demographics that are minority-based will not succeed. And what Islam comes to do is to not be a deen that is about self-service. But good religion from our tradition standpoint is one that brings its practitioner to take on social ailments and injustices. And if your practice of religion doesn't bring you to that, what's the point of your religion? What is it seeking to actually do in terms of how it functions societally? And this is something that is imperative. My children and I were walking down the streets to come here today for Jummah. And there was a man walking through the middle of 4th Street, not on the sidewalks, but just in the middle of the road. My son said, why is he walking in the middle of the road? A shopping cart similar to many that you have likely seen, not filled only to its capacity, but overflowing with plastic bags to the brim, bottles and cans that he has collected from other bags to go and build for himself a revenue stream through recycling these things. And I said to my children, well, why do you think that he is doing this? Because the intentionality behind the question is going to now be something. Is it a question that is rooted in I am somehow elevating myself by denigrating someone else? Or am I seeking to understand with empathy and love, the same love that is rooted in this hadith that tells us you won't have iman until you love for people what you love for yourself. And you won't have iman until you love one another. And if you don't have iman, you're not going to Jannah. May Allah make us all people of paradise. My babies, as they're letting the words flow out, And then they're not scared to ask questions because they're still children. And to be able to recognize and understand the reality of an individual who is working harder than hard, that you can't buy into a trope that says, well, somebody's just not working hard enough. And that's why they're not where we might be in our place in life. Just because you have it doesn't mean you deserve it. The idea that a person might be spending now in this summer heat hours going through bags to pull things out that will give them a dime for a bottle. And you add up the numbers the way my son and my daughter and I did and said that if they got to this much, then that's $10. And they got to this much, it's $100. And then we say, what can you do in New York City for $100? What can you do in the borough of Manhattan? You go to gentrified Brooklyn. You go to now the Bronx, which is increasing in its gentrification. You see black and brown families that are getting pushed out again and again and again as real estate sits empty because people are buying things but not living in them. And is our dean supposed to be a dean that revitalizes communities or plays a role in pushing people out of what was their homes generationally. And I said to my babies, do you think this man has children? Do you think he's worried about feeding his own kids? Do you think he might have elderly parents the way that I do, your grandparents who have health issues? What is our responsibility in these situations? 
And then I said to them, what do you think we should be doing as Muslims? What should we do? My son said, we should never yell at somebody who is walking down the street like this, thinking they're disrupting our path, getting in front of our Uber, our cab, our own car. We should never look down at somebody who is going through bags on the street because we don't know why it is that it is that they're doing. Maybe they have a little kid at home that they want to just get something extra to eat or something to eat at all. My daughter, she built upon it more and the conversation started to continue. And we said one of the things that we could also individually make sure that we never do is believe that somehow by virtue of where we are in our life, we are better than this person because of where they are. Love and arrogance don't exist in the same heart. It's not possible. A mustard seed, an atom's weight of that arrogance in your heart becomes a preventin for you to go into Jannah. And to understand what it all gets rooted in. Notions and ideas that are far away from what is the prophetic example of being able to engage somebody and understand with empathy and love and compassion. The opportunity for us to go to the depths of what this dean is about, for you to think out, why do you have the degree that you have? Why do you have the wealth that you have? Why do you have the credentials, the networks that you have? They definitely weren't given to you so that you could walk by someone pretending like they don't even exist, or even worse, not notice in the first place that they're there. Your heart is supposed to be something that sees the world differently from the way others see it. You're Muslim. It's supposed to inform you in a different way. And our Prophet ﷺ, he does this for people. A man comes to the Messenger of God ﷺ, seeking some assistance because he doesn't have any money. The Prophet ﷺ, he says to this person, what do you have in your home that you can bring to me? He doesn't have so much. They got a blanket that they use as a sleeping mattress, something to provide them with warmth. They eat upon it if they have food to eat, and they have a plate that they utilize for meals if they get them. He brings the meal to the Messenger وسلم, the plate rather to the Prophet وسلم, and the Prophet takes the plate and stands in front of the Jama'ah and he asks the people, هذا, who is going to buy this? And somebody gives an offer for the plate. Can we have everybody just move in close again, please? If you can come fill up the spots in front of you. And your sisters too, if we can move in and up and kind of fill in the areas so that we can fit as many people as possible in the room. We appreciate it. So the Prophet them, he shows them this and says, May yashtarihada, who will buy this? And somebody makes an offer for it, and he then asks May Yazid, who will give more? And as a tangent, this becomes a legal proof for auctions in our traditions. And at the end, when he's collected this money, he tells this man to go to the market and buy the blade of an axe. And after he has purchased the axe with his own blessed hand, the Messenger وسلم, takes a piece of wood and creates now something to hold, to formulate an entire axe. And he says, go use this to chop wood and then take the wood to the market and sell it in the market to create a regular source of income for this man. To not just help him in the moment, but to utilize the intellectual capacity you've been given to think, how do we break the cycle? How do we crush the system, the structure that is antithetical to our way of existence? That doesn't dignify every person simply because they're a person. Walaqad karamna bani adam is our theology. And then you start to think for your own self. A sister came to see me earlier this week and she sat with me in my office. She herself publicly has spoken about being a survivor of abuse. 
May Allah grant her ease and all those who have gone through any reality similar to that. Amen. May Allah forgive those of us and give hidayah to those of us who think that there is any reason as to why we have capacity to abuse someone and help us to wake up before we stand in front of him on that day and are taken to account for the abuse that we told out to others. And as she sat with me and she said, I want you to help me with something. I've worked in different industries, for-profit, non-profit, and my hope has always been to do something at a bigger scale to support people in need. Taking all of her skills, her credentials, her networks, working in different areas, saying to me, what I want to do is build this factory that's going to give jobs to Uyghur refugees in Turkey. And there's an added variable that they're going to actually own the factory as well. And then what they produce, we're going to bring to retail here in the States. And in Virginia, we're going to set up an opportunity for women who are survivors of abuse, widows, orphans, to have jobs that will not pay them minimum wage, but salaries that will give them financial empowerment that will allow for them to then be versatile in other industries and stand on their feet. And because this will be a non-profit, the revenue generated that exceeds our expenses. We're going to not take and give to shareholders or for ourselves, but just put it back into the system. So we open up more factories for demographics in places like Yemen and Afghanistan and Pakistan, where people are not treating people always well. Refugee populations that are at the highest in the world. And then we utilize wealth to create wealth, to create jobs, to ensure that people's needs are being met. And she said, what do you think of this idea? And I said, may Allah give you tawfiq in it and make us a community that gets behind you. It's the kind of ideas that we need. You have a lot of skill. You have to just acknowledge it. You have more capacity than you might realize. You have to think about how it is that you are working to that potential. The bar to entry in this deen is not something that is very high. You don't have to be the person who has memorized the entire mushaf. You don't have to be the person who can spit out Arabic in deep grammatical eloquence. You don't have to be the person who knows every hadith inside and out to just be somebody who can access the divine. But to think deeply about what is all of this for? What is it that we were put here to do? What is it that we are working towards? And how do we understand what it is that exists systemically and structurally and build out what it is that we might not be able to go out and help every single one, but we can do what we can for those that we have the capacity to do for. And this is a sector that is deeply imperative to be able to understand to be able to offer people insight as to how to navigate systems that are purposely built to hold them down. To realize that if it is not Muslims who are thinking about our brother who is walking through the streets in blazing humid heat, trying to just gain something for himself, and we sit down and say, hey man, what can we do to help people who are in this situation? What can we do to break people out of what is systemic and structural? You think that if he is in it, his children are not going to be in it, and their children are not going to be in it? When you look to the roots of where all of this starts, it's not anything that's doing other than what it was intended to do. To ensure that certain people retain privilege, to ensure that certain people retain power, to ensure that certain people are in a place where they have comfort. The idea of you and I being in a space that we are able to benefit from should not be one that keeps us from losing our ability to contemplate and reflect deeply upon what it is that we are actually supposed to be doing. And embedded within that is an understanding that the beneficiary of all of this is not going to be anyone other than you. 
Because all you take when you leave from this place is the deeds that it is that you undertook. The only thing that's going to move forward from our worldly existence is not going to be any of the stuff that surrounds us, but the actions that we chose to choose to decide upon. Why wouldn't you want to have your book include that you build something that helped generations of people not be forced out of their homes? Why wouldn't you want to be in a place where, because of you, those who had no food for days and weeks at a time were now in a place where they could get a regular hot meal? Why wouldn't you want your book to include that you took the time out to sit and think about how it is that this du'a is not applicable to me, but it is applicable to all those that are around me? That our Prophet wasallam taught us to turn to the divine. And Allah Zawjal, He tells us that on the day of judgment, that, O oh, son of Adam, you did not visit me when I was hungry. You did not feed me when I was hungry. Give me drink when I was thirsty or visit me when I was sick. Ya Rabbil Alameen, you are the Lord of the heavens and the earth. How can we give to you food? How can we give you drink? How can we visit you when you were sick? A servant was hungry, was thirsty, they were ill. You did not go to them. Had you gone to them, you would have found me there. The contentment of your heart rests upon these actions. To be bold enough to think with creativity. Your Prophet وسلم, he is described, Gana Ahlam al Nas, that quite often gets translated as the most forbearant of people knew how to contain himself in states of emotional duress. But the word for dreams in Arabic is also ahlam. What Sheikh Hamza says is that this hadith gives ishara that the Prophet ﷺ was also the best of dreamers. He wasn't afraid to dream. And the way the sister walks into the space and says that your community is a generous community. And it wasn't just an idea. She's got everything lined up, structured, plans. It all makes sense. And she also has the networks that she has built over years of working in industries that she is a good person to do this. But a lot of you also have this as well. You gotta just overcome what's going on inside and say, hey, what can I also build? I don't have to leave everything behind. You don't have to abandon your day-to-day -day work. But you become bold enough, courageous enough to utilize the creativity that Allah gave to you in the first place. To turn to the people sitting around you and saying that, what are we equipped to be able to make happen? The clinics, the pantries, the ventures that make jobs. It boggles my mind that in New York City there is not a Muslim community that has built out a solid re-entry program for people coming out of the prison systems. Makes no sense. There's a million of us in this city. How is that not something that has already taken place and happened? That's where we have to get it done. And you walk through the streets and you see everything as a sign of something. How you see someone doesn't tell you about who they are, but how you see someone will tell you a lot about yourself. My son asked me the other day, or told me rather about an experience that he and my daughter, his big sister had, where they came upon another man who was trying to also get cans and bottles out of these bags on the streets. And he said, this person was deeply frustrated, Baba, and he was using language that wasn't good language. I said, why do you think he's frustrated, Kareem? Well, he was upset that he wasn't finding anything in the bags. I said, well, why is that upsetting to him? And he said, well, if he doesn't find anything in the bags and he spent hours looking for things that he could go take to get a dime for a bottle and there was nothing at the end of two hours, he might not be able to have money at the end of the day to have something to eat for himself. He might not be able to have money at the end of the day to have something for his children to eat. 
How you hear his frustration ringing through your ears will give you a perspective of what you think of him as a person. And the sunnah of our teacher, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is to look for reasons to accept and to think out how it is that we build for others. The Prophet literally had a genre of companions that were called the Ashab al Sufa, the people who were so stricken with poverty, they literally just lived outside of the masjid. And they weren't just living outside of the masjid, because if you've ever been to Medina, the Prophet's house shares a wall with the masjid. You got nowhere else to go? Come and just be here with me. Follow that sunnah. Don't be scared to love people in a world that isn't rooted in love as an intrinsic value. There's enough selfishness and greed from a lot of others who make excuses as to why someone might not have food or why somebody might not have shelter. There's literally office buildings that many of you used to work in that are sitting empty. Why can't people at a time where homelessness is crazy in this city live in those places? Why not? Why do the tents that are set up for the migrants that are in our city, because they literally got shipped out of other states, have people that are in such close proximity that the cots that they're gonna sleep on are head to toe and head to toe? Maybe because people of Ihsan are not involved necessarily in the decision making here. People of Iman who live this hadith rooted in the idea that the completion of your Iman is in loving for someone what you love for yourself. In this day of Juma, be bold enough to ask Allah to make you the answer to people's prayers. And when you walk through the streets of this city, recognize that every five blocks is filled with worlds of experience that are different from each other. Anytime I ask my children, what should I tell people? What should I talk about? We go through this hodgepodge of circular thoughts. Some of them like, what are you even saying, man? I don't even know what you mean. But an end thought that always comes is Baba, just tell them to be nice to others. Tell them to treat people well. And I pray my children hold on to this for the entirety of their lives in this world. Because I love each of you, I pray that Allah makes each of you bold enough to recognize your own light, your own luminosity, and dare to live with kindness, dare to live with real unbounded compassion, dare to live with real love. As I've said to you before, we've gotten out of the mess of this pandemic, we're going to get back into the business of building for others what we have capacity to build and to build for ourselves, which we should not expect anyone else to build for ourselves. So allow for yourself to get into that space so that we can get done what it is that we should be getting done. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم إن الحمد لله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا مولانا محمدا عبده ورسول. People will say, where can I start in this process? A lot of you have knowledge bases and skill bases that people can benefit from. A woman who goes into a marriage that she thinks is going to be uplifting for her, but is anything other than that. 
met with just abuse and all kinds of horror. You think she knows how to always write a resume for her? Self? Has job training skills? Has the ability to know when she's coming out of that, how to have her own credit card, bank account, financially plan? You can help somebody do that. It's not a mistake that the curricula we get exposed to from the time we're in kindergarten through the time we graduate high school in this country doesn't teach us basic tangible skills. Most people in this room are going to be shackled in debt for a long period of their life. Some of you know how to give sound financial advice to people. You benefit from it for yourselves. You can help people. You just have to think about it from a different standpoint. Shift the paradigm. Not what is it that I can do with an intention that is rhetorical that says there's nothing that I can offer, but digging deep and saying that I actually have things that I could help people with. You're not myopic in terms of what it means to assist people through the prism of your faith. Because people are whole, entire people. They need things. The elders in our community who are still immunocompromised and are not able to come down here and live in a city that's already lonely and have no one that is there that's looking after them and are tuning in to a live stream to get the best of what it is they can given the situation. You can go spend an hour with them on a Sunday and just hear them tell stories that they haven't spoken to anybody in a long time. You can visit the sick in the hospital. You can experience these things and allow for yourself to have them be an entry point to something bigger. But you have to want it. You have to want to be that person. You have to want to be a person of mahabba, a person of love. You have to want to be a person of compassion, a person of rahmah. You have to say that my Islam is not a sociological identity variable. It's not something I inherited. But it's a discursive theology that I have to be able to start to explain to myself and then live that faith towards others as to why I think this is true. And then what does somebody look like who actually believes in this thing? And you have it in you. As we get more people to start thinking in that way, the deeper impact we have as a collective are going to be things you can't even imagine. And may Allah make this a community that continues to do the things that others say cannot be done. But we need each one of us to step up and make that happen. So make this du'a for yourself. Allah makes you the reason people have hope in this world and never the reason that people might dread it. In Allah wa malaika zahu yusalluna ala nabi Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad fi al-awwalina wa fi al-akhirin Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barik wa sallama ya arhamu rahimin Allahumma innaka afuwa kareemun tuhibu al-afwa faafu anna ya'muka liba al-kuloob thabbit kuloobana ala dinik Allahumma ja'alna min al-mukhlisin Allahumma ja'alna min al-mukhlisin Allahumma ja'alna we begin this supplication in your name, Ya Allah, and beseech you to send your choicest salutations upon your most beloved, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. We ask that you shower your infinite mercy upon this gathering, granting each and every one who is present herein and our loved ones only the best in this world and the best in the next. We ask, Ya Allah, that if all of us are meant to be together only at this time, at this place, whether we are young or old, male or female, regardless of our race, our ethnicity, our social class, our country of origin, our cultural heritage, whether we are Muslim or come from a different walk of life, Ya Rabbi, if our individual hearts are meant to be in the presence of all of their hearts that are gathered here only at this time, at this place, 
then gather us all together again in the best of places in the world beyond this one. Increase us, Ya Allah, in all that is good. Increase us in courage, compassion, and confidence. Protect us from affliction, anxiety, and anguish. Remove from our hearts any feelings of bitterness, jealousy, animosity, or envy towards any of your creation. Grant us hearts that are filled with understanding and love. Hearts that are drawn towards things of real goodness and beauty. Hearts that find themselves deep in your remembrance, for indeed in your remembrance do hearts find rest. Bring ease, Ya Rabbi, to all those in our community, our city, in this world who find themselves in any state of financial duress or insecurity. Make us those who follow the sunnah of your beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam outwardly and inwardly and so deep into our hearts a deep love for your creation. Remove from our hearts anything that impedes us from elevating and harnessing that love, especially those things that make us not love ourselves in ways that we need to in order to be a source of light for others. Help us to see ourselves the way that you see us. Help us to see ourselves for what it is that we can bring a benefit to your creation. Instill within us sincerity, strength, so that we might go out and engage in acts of selflessness, not selfishness, to live in such a way where we see how we can bring benefit to your creation. Through us, Ya Allah, feed your creation. Through us, Ya Allah, clothe your creation. Through us, Ya Allah, give shelter to your creation. Through us, Ya Allah, give strength to your creation. Through us, Ya Allah, give hope to your creation. Through us, Ya Allah, love your creation. And fill our hearts with an unbounded sense of self-love that enables us to go out and live each day as best as we can rather than an unhealthy love of ourselves that sees us in this world as something that has no means of benefit for others. Make this community always one that brings the best out for your creation. Make us those that will build the shelters, the clinics, the pantries that our neighbors are in need of. Endeavor us to have elevated leadership and let those who are here be in a place where their inspiration doesn't stop at the end of the day, but it moves forward to, with real ihsan, build out the strategies, the plans, and the teams necessary to get done what we have the ability to do. Make us those, Ya Allah, who when we stand in front of you, we can say that we tried our best to fulfill the purpose that you intended for us. Help us to not be distracted by this dunya and help us to always remember that with every step we take in this world, we are drawn closer to the reality that is the world beyond this one. Make us, Ya Rabbi, people of your Jannah. Protect us always from hearts that are not humble, tongues that are not wise, and eyes that have forgotten how to cry. Forgive us for our shortcomings and guide and bless us all. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samir alim. Wa tub alayna ya maulana innaka anta tawab al rahim. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khari khalkihi muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Bi rahmatika ya arhma rahameen. Wa akim as We hope you enjoyed our podcast. If you're inspired by the work that we're doing at the IC and want to help keep it going, subscribe to our podcasts, follow us on social media, donate to help support us at icnyu.org, and most importantly, keep us in your continued du'as. Until next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>